How do you preach now? <laughs> I believe that God's given me a word um, for the church. I had that anticipation, and I have it even more right now for your congregation, for your pastor and his wife and family. I believe that God wants to do a new thing in this church, amen? amen. In this community, in this city. And pastor Bob said, you know, I came to Madison. We came back, we came to Madison in 2006 to plant a church in Verona. And, and all the pastors and leaders here said it was a graveyard for church planters. It was a graveyard for pastors. That was a place to come and pretty much die, you know. And um, I remember talking with my wife and, and just saying, it's not going to be true of us. And, um, you know, they're just being pessimist. And, and then we came to Madison and we began to experience the same thing that a lot of these pastors had experienced. And we started to feel the heaviness and, and the weight and, um, the burnout and the drain of just trying to move forward and do what God we believe that was calling us to do and I can just say right now that that God is good and that oh, God yeah. works and um, yeah. and despite what what we come with our preconceived ideas of what's going to happen that God is a God who does exceedingly abundantly more than what we can even think or imagine Amen. Amen. And there's, a, there's times where you just keep going back to the Word, you keep going back to the promises. And I remember one of the verses, I remember sitting in front of East Town Mall in my car, and I was listening to uh, a CD in our car called Drive Time Devotions, and we were going through James on the devotional track, and it talked about not being tossed to and fro, and to not doubt. You know how many times I've had to go back to that scripture? You know how many times doubt had tried to creep into my mind and say, you know, are you sure you're supposed to be here? Are you sure you're in God's will? Are you sure you've heard from God? Are you sure you shouldn't leave? Are you sure, you know, how many have been there before? And let's keep going back to that. Don't be tossed like the waves. Trust. Trust. So I believe that God's giving me a message for you this morning. And I want you to open in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 43. Verses 14 to 20, we're going to look at this morning. I want to break that down verse by verse to encourage you today. How many of you here this morning are looking for a fresh start in your life? Amen. You need a fresh start in your finances, or maybe you're looking for a fresh start in your marriage, or maybe you're looking for a fresh start in your, for your family, your career, or just a fresh start in life. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 14 through 20 are going to encourage us this morning. Isaiah is written um, by the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, and he's speaking here to the Israelite people in the verses that we're about to read. And Israel was a people with a strong history. How many have read about or maybe seen the illustrated videos on TV of, of the Israelite children crossing the Red Sea, you know. So there are people that were delivered out of Egyptian bondage. They were delivered out of Pharaoh's hold. They were people who crossed a, a parted Red Sea and watched as their enemies drowned. They were people who possessed the promised land. But here they are, back in Babylonian captivity. How many know that all their previous victories weren't enough to save them now? They needed a new work. Amen? Amen. They needed a new miracle, a new victory. They needed a fresh start, just like many of you raise your hand this morning. They were there. They were in this hopeless situation and said, God, I need a fresh start in my life. I need a new work right now can't rest upon yesterday's victories. We need you to work today. And let's look at verses 14 through 20. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon, Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians and the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. 
Verse 16, this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. Verse 17, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Verse 18, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. And this is my words. You ain't seen nothing yet. It says, now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen. Let's pray. Father, I just pray, thank you this morning. I thank you for your word, Lord, that is true. I thank you, Lord, that when we waver, your word still remains the same. Lord, I thank you this morning, Jesus, that you want to do a fresh work in our lives, in our families, in our ministries, for your glory to bring honor to your name, Lord. You want to do a fresh work here in Madison, Lord, and you want to use Capital City Church to do it. You want to use Pastor Bob and Tina in this congregation. Lord, I thank you that we're a part of a bigger church, a city church this morning. And I thank you, Lord, as we join arms together, Lord, that we can do great things here in this city. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So with their home and temple destroyed, and as the years in exile became not just one year or two years, but many decades, the great question that burned in the hearts of the Israelites was this. Is this situation hopeless? That was a question that burned in their hearts. Is this situation hopeless? Is there a way out of, of the impossible? Is there a way out of this difficult time? Is there a way home? Have you ever been there? Lord, is there a way out? See, this was a feeling of a people who were feeling completely hopeless, whose faith was reaching a breaking point that God stepped in and spoke. And as he did so, it was like he had to reintroduce himself all over again. Again in verse 15, he says to them, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. Isn't it true that we, sometimes we get so caught up in our mess, we get so caught up in the difficult situations that we're, that we're dealing with, we get so caught up in the details of it, the anxiety begins to crowd out all the things that we know that are real and true and good. And that just that cloud of depression comes over us and we begin to forget about the one who's in control. And it's like God knew this and so he came and he had to reintroduce himself again to his people. And he says, I am the Lord, your God, your holy one, your king. He reminds them that he is the creator of Israel. He says to them, Israel, you're my people. You didn't come here, come into existence by accident. It was through the plan and purpose of God. So the Lord was saying to them, I created you. You are mine. Do you really think that I'm going to forget you now? Or do you really think right now I'm going to let you go? And then he reminds his people that he is king with a capital K. See, they were in exile and in captivity um, under the Babylonian rule to a king with a little K, but there still was a king with a big K that was in charge. Are you with me this morning? This is good news. Then in verse 16, God introduces himself as the God who makes a way. This is what the Lord says, verse 16. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. What God was doing here was reminding them of their past, in particular of a time when there previously seemed like there was no way out. It was them in the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them. God caused the waters to part. And he took them through on dry land to the other side. And they turned and watched as the parted waters began to decrease and envelop the armies 
And he snuffed him out like it says, like a wick. Extinguished him. And they saw the deliverance of their God. Out of Egypt, Egyptian held. Exodus 14. If you want to turn over there to Exodus 14. Let's look at that real quick. Verses 13 and 14. And then we're going to jump to 21 and 22. All this is just context for what we're going to be looking at here this morning. God's word for us this morning. Exodus 14, verse 13 and 14, it says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Isn't that awesome? Amen. The difficulty you see today, you'll never see again. The problems you're facing today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. A lot of times we want to do the fighting, don't we? But you need to be still. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Friends, this is what God wants to speak to you this morning. He is still a God who makes a way through the sea. He is still the God, a God who makes a way through the sea. Now, I believe that God wanted me to throw this in here this morning. That doesn't mean that you know, aren't going to have to go through the waters. Okay? I don't want you to leave this morning and say, oh man, God's going to deliver me just like that. Thank you, God. I want the church and now I'm driving home in victory and nothing is going to ever be the same again. I'm not going to have any more problems. That's not what I'm here to tell you this morning. Amen. Could happen. Could happen. But what God wants to share with you this morning is that he is a God who makes a way through. Through. You know, the picture that I had when I was looking at that was when Jesus and the disciples were in the boat. And the disciples saw the storm come up and the waves and they were all afraid and they went to Jesus and what was he doing? Sleeping. sleeping. Yeah. Why was he sleeping? Because he knew the promise. He said, we're going to make it to the other side. Right? How many know that when, he's, when Jesus says, we're going to make it to the other side, you're going to get to the other side? Yeah. Doesn't mean that the storms are going to try to come up and discourage you and batter against you and, and all the things and the promises that God has spoken to you. But if you hold on in the midst of the storm, you will get to the other side. You will get to the other side. God is a God who makes a way. How many remember that song by Don Moen? Yep. If I would have had time, I would have called Tina and said, hey, can you learn that and, and sing it this morning? God, um, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. Let's look at verse 18 here. And this is where I want to rest on for the rest of the message this morning. Verse 18 says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Wait a minute. He starts off by reintroducing himself, right? I am king with a capital K. I'm the Holy One of Israel. Yes. Remember the former things that I did for you. Remember how I delivered you out of Egyptian bondage. And now he's saying in verse 18, forget about that. Is he schizophrenic? <laughs> remember, forget, remember. No. Forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. You know, what he's saying here is that yesterday's victories won't save us today. Right? Yesterday's victories won't save us, save us today. By telling them to forget the former things, God didn't have any intention of his people forgetting the things that he had done in the past, but he didn't want them to rest there. He's saying, you know how awesome that was? And you remember, you know, remember the walls of water and how I parted the sea and how you walked across on dry land and I took care of all, all your enemies in the past? 
Well, I want you to forget about that because what I'm going getting ready to do for you in the present is going to be even bigger than what I've done for you in the past. How many think that that was a great word for them? What, what started out as maybe we're going to be in this captivity and Babylonian rule for, for a while became years and years turned into decades. And then now God intervenes and said, remember when I delivered you from the Egyptians? Well, I'm going to do something even greater than that for you right now while you were in Babylonian captivity. But first, I need you to change your address. I need you to change your address. I want you to write that down this morning if you've got a pen and paper and taking notes. Because the second half of verse 18 says, do not dwell on the past. I want you to change your address. Because how many know that word, the word dwell means to reside? Where you dwell is where you live. Right? Where you dwell is where you live. God is saying through Isaiah, don't live in the past. He's not saying don't remember the past. He's saying I don't want you to reside there, to live there, to rest there, to put all your faith there. He's saying use the past as a guidepost, but not as a hitching post. See, it's one thing to go through your old picture books, right? It's one thing to get out all the old scrapbooks. Whenever I go home, I like to get out the scrapbooks and, and um, go into mom and dad's room and still have the baby books and all the books from when I was in high school full of pictures and love to reminisce and saying, hey, this is when your dad was skinnier, you know? <laughs> this is when your dad was in good shape. This is when your dad was the star of the football team and, you know, feeling pretty puffed up there. And, and uh, this is, hey, check this out. You know, this was, I got that awesome gift that Christmas. You know, check this out, Josh. But they don't make gifts like this anymore. And, you know, and just reliving the past, you know, and, and it's exciting. And um, sometimes you come across a few pictures and it, and it sparks a moment that you're like, man, that's not so good. You know, let's just skip over a few of those, those pictures or those memories because there was a time in your past that maybe things weren't as great. You know, that ex-girlfriend, you know? that breakup or, or whatever, that person you thought, man, I'm going to spend my whole life with, and you find all the old love letters, and you're like, nah, I don't want to go there, you know? And uh, see, we, we're not to reside in the past. It's one thing to, to go back and, and relive some of those memories, but how many know that God is doing a new thing right now? Amen. God's doing a new thing right now. For some people, it's easy to let go of the past, and for others, it's hard, right? Proverbs 23, 7 says this. When I think about dwelling, what are you dwelling on? That question, I think of Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Do you know that your mind is the road that the enemy uses to get access to your life? For as a man thinketh, so is he. How many know that we need to put up a roadblock in our mind. Pastor Bob will know this. I remember taking a trip to San Diego and uh, thinking, hey, it'd be kind of cool to go down to Mexico for a day. And how many know they're on the border? There's a security checkpoint. You don't get access and you're not allowed to leave unless you have the right paperwork, right? And as I think about this, we need a security checkpoint in our mind. Because it's the road, it's the path that the enemy uses to get a hold of our life. How many know that if the enemy can take your thoughts captive, he can take you captive? That's right. That's right. For as a man thinketh, so is he. You know, the Bible talks a lot about what you think upon, where you dwell. How many know that you can be in a room of crowd of people and be alone with just you and your thoughts? You ever see those people that just kind of have those blank stares? It's like all these people around, but they're just like staring. I remember this past week we were on vacation and Josh said to mom, 
Mom, what's wrong? Nothing. She was, she was like that. She was just kind of staring. We were all, there were people doing things all around us, and, and my wife was just staring, and Josh said something. He said, Mom, are you all caught up in your head again? <laughs> How many of you have ever been there? It's caught up in your head. Yeah. Things are going on, it can be good going on around you, but you're caught up in your head. I wonder if that's where the Israelites were caught up in their head. God had delivered them in the past. God had made a way where there seemed to be no way. And now they're just sitting there caught up in their head. And God has to come back on the scene and say, hey, wake up. You ever had your spouse or friend do that to you? Wake up. Come alive. Join, join, the, join us. Are you there? You know, anybody home? You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Lisa's like, I'm fine. You know, I'm great. Like, no, you haven't been with us for the last 10 minutes. Okay, well, you know, let, let's go. Let's, you know, whatever, okay. What are you thinking about? Oh, nothing. And you know there's something. Something was on your mind. Something had your attention. So God comes and he intervenes and he's, he's saying, hey, wake up. Quit dwelling on the past. I'm going to do a new thing. And then I want to move on to this next part. What's he telling them here? He says, do not dwell on the past. And then he says, see, see I'm doing a new thing. Verse 19, now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? The key word here is perceive. Perceive is to know by seeing, cure, recognition, acknowledge, aware of, understand. Friends, I can say with perfect honesty and belief and faith this morning that God is involved in every one of your lives here this morning. God is involved in the minute details of every one of your lives here this morning. But the question is this, do you perceive it? Do you perceive it? Point number two, first is what? Change your address, change where you dwell. Change what you're thinking on. Where are you dwelling this morning? God is the God of, he's a now God, he's I am. Remember my grandma Rates used to tell me when I would get down, I would get caught up in my mind, she would say, hey Lance, what's going on? She just had a way, you know, grandma's intuition had a way of knowing and I would sit down with her and she was a grandma who would sit and listen. And um, I would pour out my heart and I remember she, one, one point she said this, she said, don't, don't worry about the past, your God is in I was. And I said, but grandma, what about the future? She said, don't worry about the future, he's not I will be. He is a now God. He's, he's I am. He's a God of today. And she's, then she would say, don't you perceive what God is doing or is, is done through your life? And she would remind me of, of my gifts, my talents, and my abilities. And, and she would begin to encourage me. And I would always leave grandma's feeling lifted up and, and ready to take on the world again. And friends, I believe that God wants to, wants to encourage you this morning to perceive his hand that is at work in each of your lives this morning. <clears throat> See, there's times in our lives where we get caught up in our mess. We get caught up in all the details of life that we forget to see that God is still at work in our lives. I remember getting a phone call from, from a girl. Actually, it was a Facebook message. Um, a private message on Facebook from a, a girl in the Madison area. I had just met her at a network event, networking event, and... I, was, I remember being impressed by her boldness for a nonprofit organization um, that wanted to end child abuse. And we were in this meeting together. It was probably about a room this size, about 100 people um, together. And we were passing around the microphone, introducing each other. And it came to this gal, and she stood up. And instead of just telling everybody her name, she tells her name, and then she goes on to talk about her her mission um, in this nonprofit that she's involved in, and trying to rally up people to support her in this walk around the Capitol um, to raise funds to end child abuse. And and I thought, man, you know, if if I just had that boldness to be able to just to command the room and make everybody focus on me, 
she just, you know, there's some people that can do that, and it's like, oh man, I'm embarrassed, you know, there's always one person that has to ruin the party, but it wasn't like that for her. It was like people were tuned in, they were listening because her passion was contagious. And she, here she is, a few weeks later, she's private messaging me. She's like, I'm going through a change right now in my life. I just listened to this TED talk by this guy named Rick Warren. And um, he's talking about, about using what's in your hand and, and what on earth am I here for. And, it, and, this, and I looked and it was a TED talk from like back in the 1990s, late 90s, when his book Purpose Driven Life just came out. And um, I read the book and it's aware of what she was talking about. And, and she's like, I just, I just feel like there's something more. I'm just looking for what God has placed some things in my hand. And, and she wasn't a believer. And she said, and, and I was thinking, who is probably one of the um, most spiritual people in my life? You know, and she said, I know, I'm going to message Lance. And so I thought that, wow, that's pretty cool that she, she thought that from just a few encounters with me. And, and so she said, can I come by the cafe and sit down with you? I just want to ask you some questions. And I was so excited for this meeting. She came by Yola, so we, we sat down, and the cafe was busy, and, and she um, began to ask me some questions. And she said, you know, this is what my background, I went to school for this and this, and she began to share some of her strengths and her abilities and talents and things like that. And then she said, I'm looking for um, a job. I've been working for all these nonprofits, and I'm looking for a job that's going to um, really allow me to, to do more and to make more. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, wow, what a coincidence. A friend of mine who happens to be a Christian who owns an ad agency is looking for somebody to be kind of an ambassador for the nonprofits that she works with. Um, when I'm done meeting with this gal, I'm gonna call up my friend and see if she's interested in doing an interview. So I didn't tell it to this gal, I just listened to her. And I said, said to this gal on the, at the end of our con con conversation together, I said, well, you've done a lot of good things and I'm impressed with your zeal and with your boldness. And I want to tell you this, if you really want to do even more through your life um, for good to help people, you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and find out your purpose and why he's created you and what he's got in mind for you. I said, you can do a lot of great things, but God has some God things for you to do. And she said, yeah, but this is Madison, you know, and started going into that whole coexist thing. You know, that's, that's good, but there's so many people that believe so many different things. And though I was inspired by Rick Warren and his message and, and the purpose driven life and what's in my hand, I believe that's just only one way. How, how, Lance, how can you really, really, really be sure that your way is the right way? or the only way. And I said, well, let me tell you this, Whitney. I'm not going to try to make you pray a prayer with me. I'm not going to sit here and make you feel bad about your life or what you believe. But do this. Leave here today and the next month, every day, say, God, make yourself real to me. And then let's get back together and let's see what God's going to do in your life. And she said, that's it. I said, that's it. Got on email, sent an email over to my friend, said, hey, there's a gal that's got a great background and work that you're looking for. She's not a believer yet, but I believe that she's close and that God's marked her for him. And, and um, you know, if you're interested in, in interviewing her, didn't hear back from the email, just assume that maybe nothing happened. About three weeks later, I got an email back from Laura saying I hired her. She's awesome. It's working out great. Um, a couple weeks later, Lance, we're doing a virtual What on Earth Am I Here For? Study together through Rick Warren's new book, his follow-up to The Purpose Driven Life. Um, then she messages me, texts me one day and says, Whitney's on fire for God. She just got off the phone with um, this Christian author and just her questions that she's asking. 
And um, you know what that did for me? It made me think there's some times where I would just, like, man, I just wake up in the morning, go to work, make coffee, drinks for people all day, make sandwiches, do all this, came here to plant a church, and in this cafe environment, God, did I miss you? And God had just began to speak to me and say, can't you see what I'm doing through your life right now? Don't you perceive it? And I think that's what he was speaking to the Israelites. We're just caught up in their daily life. Just, man, we're just going through the motions here. Can't see that we're making any headway. And God shows up and says, can't you perceive that I've been involved in all the minute details of your life? Don't you perceive it? Can't you see it? So my second point is this. You need to change your address. And second, you need to learn to squint. See, I'm 40 years old and my eyesight isn't as good as it was when I was in my 20s. My dad used to say I had eagle eyes. He said, man, Lance, if, if anybody could see it, you can see it. I would spot, I had this Rain Man type of mind when I was younger. I would memorize license plate numbers. We would know all my family's license plate numbers, people, friends in the church would be like, hey, there's... There's so-and-so, and like, how do you know? And that's his car. Well, that could be anybody's car. Nope. TG3049. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> what else? You got eagle eyes. My eyes aren't that good anymore, and I don't memorize license plates anymore. And sometimes I need to learn to squint. You know, you ever talk about somebody say, hey, do you see that in that picture? And you're like, what? You know, it's kind of cool. The author, the, the painter of that picture has kind of got his name in there. It's like, where? You're going to squint. Oh, I see it now. And that's how we, what we need to do sometimes in our, in our walk with the Lord. Just need to squint and really focus in and see what he's doing. And lastly, we need to expect the makeover. How many like that, that TV show, Extreme Makeover Home Edition? Yeah. Don't you ever wonder sometimes? It's like, well, why don't you guys just knock down that piece of junk and just build a new house? But they go in there and they'll take something that is is already existing, right? they will knock out a few walls and make some minor adjustments and, and Sears will come in and got some new craftsman products for this and, and uh, then they bring that big bus and put it in front of the house and then they say, move that bus and everybody's sh sh cheering and there's tears flowing and it's like this brand new house that is specifically built now to, to help the family with all their needs and um, it's got this air purification system and this water system and, and a beautiful garden out back and you're going to be able to live off your land now and know it's all good and, it's, and um, it, you know that's what I think God does he, he doesn't just come in and like make it all good for us but sometimes he'll just like take our mess and turn it into a ministry he'll take what's already there and remodel it and use it for his use See, sometimes we're like, man, I wish my life wasn't like this. I wish, I wish that I was different. I wish I was more like so-and-so. And God said, remember, I'm, I'm your king. I created you. You are mine. And I'm going to take you with all your mess and with all your past. And I'm going to use it for my glory. I'm going to make a ministry out of it. Amen? Amen. Stand with me this morning. wants to take what's already there and make it even better. In verse 20, the wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen. What do you see this morning? Do you see problems? Or do you see possibilities? Do you see a God who makes a way? Or do you see a desert? Do you see a wasteland this morning? Or do you see streams? God wants to create a way in the dry and desert places of your life. And streams of refreshment in the wasteland of your life. And he will if you let him. Father, I just thank you this morning. That you're not just the God of our past, but you're the God of today. You're doing something today. 
something new, something fresh today. Father, this week is working on this message and looking at these verses again. I was encouraged, Lord, that you had a specific word for this church. Three things, Lord. That you're getting ready to change your address. Maybe it's not their physical address, Lord, but it's where you're going to change where they dwell, where they reside. And I don't know all what that means, Lord, but I believe that you'll make it real to the congregation and to their pastor. And Lord, give them a spiritual sight to begin to perceive what you have been doing and what you are doing and what you're going to continue to do through this church. And lastly, Lord, I can't wait to see the makeover. <coughs> thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Lord, and Pastor Bob for his humility that I've always known, and for his heart that's always been right and open to you and wanting what you want for this church. I thank you for his heart this morning. It says, Lord, I can't bear this alone. I yoke with you. Because your yoke is easy. And your burden is light. Can't carry the weight on my own. Father, by your spirit right now, I pray that you begin to speak specifically. And to begin to apply the message this morning specifically to each person that's here. Lord, reintroduce yourself this morning. Father, I pray that you begin to remind people this morning like you used my grandma to remind me that you are the God who is I am. You're never present God in time of trouble. You're now God. You're a way maker. You, you make a way where there seems to be no way. Said so you'll go through the fire, but you won't be burned. You'll walk through the waters, but you'll still remain dry. I am the king with a capital K. Father, I pray that you begin to remind people here this morning of the great things that you've done in their past and how you delivered them before. And Lord, how you want to deliver them now. Pray, Lord, that you begin to flash pictures of things, events. Bring thoughts, Lord, into their mind of different things and begin to perceive, Lord, yes, he, you have been, God, you have been working in my life. I see it now. I see it now. Father, take them out of their mind where the enemy just wants to flood it with a bunch of negative. And, and Lord, I pray, Father, for right now for a clear mind for your people. Take them out of the junk and the chaos and all that the clouded, disconnected, staticky connection, Lord, and bring him into clarity of what you're doing right now and what you're speaking. Start the makeover this morning, Lord. Start the makeover this morning, God. Do it, Lord. Do it. just bought a pop-up camper. We went up to Door County for a week. Pulled nice behind our van, the camper, but on the way back, it was jerking like crazy. And I called a friend and he said, 
I don't know that you ever should be pulling a big camper like that with a minivan. Like, well, I wish you would have talked to me last week. As I was passing people with pop-up campers behind them, I saw these trailblazers, and bigger Silverados and Envoys, and all these bigger SUVs. And so I was just praying, I was just thinking about how sometimes it's how it is in life. We're not meant to carry around or pull big burdens like that. We're not created for that. It can mess us up. And that's why God in his word says, come yoke with me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's like hooking up that little pop-up to a big Ford Expedition like Pastor Bob's got. It's going to pull a lot better, right? Look, that's what God wants to do this morning. He wants you to hook up with Him this morning. He wants you to link up with Him this morning. You can do more together than you can do apart from God. If you're here this morning, you say, I want to hook up, I want to link up with God this morning. I need His yoke because His yoke is easy, His burden is light. I want you to just take a step towards the altar this morning. Let's just spend some time in prayer this morning. I remember some of the greatest breakthroughs were in my home church when I was in my teens and 20s. I was putting my face to a chair in the front of our church, praying and crying out. A lot of times I would leave, there would be a wet spot, just where tears were, but there was always breakthroughs that followed. So I just laid it at the feet of the Lord and said, God, I can't do it anymore. I need you. I need you. If that's you this morning, you want to change your address this morning, you, you, you're perceiving right now that God's working your life right now. He's calling you unto Him. And he wants to do a makeover in your life. I want you to take a step of faith this morning and say, Lord, I'm changing my address. I'm changing my address. And I'm not filling out one of those cards because I don't want my old mail forwarded. This is a new address. And maybe for you that means a new set of friends. Maybe that means that you need to reside and dwell in some new areas and to get away from some junk. Maybe it needs, means a new set of music, a new set of clothes. I don't know what it means for you. Maybe it's saying goodbye to some things this morning, but God is calling you to change your address. He's got a new future for you, a bright future for you this morning. I want you to step out from where you're at sitting. I want you to come forward, and I want you to begin to pray and seek God and say, God, what is a new thing that you want to do in my life today? Come on, friends. Thank you, Jesus. I want to change my address, God. 